We take our scripture today from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 37 through verse 45. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Given, it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me pick the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. The scripture now is the third section in the Sermon on the Plain, beginning in Luke chapter 6. And we've been away from that sermon for a couple of weeks, a special emphasis upon Palm Sunday and, and Easter, and now we return to it. The Sermon on the Plain is very much like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 through 7, except the Sermon on the Mount is much longer and was probably preached on a different occasion. In the first two parts of the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus has been sharing with us the character that he wants in us as his disciples, the qualities of blessings and woes that he pronounces upon our life speak of our character. And then in the verses following that, Jesus talks about the, important, the importance of loving and of loving those who have given us a difficult time, loving those who have hurt us. Now in this particular section today, Jesus is really contrasting the life of his disciples with the life that they have all seen in the Pharisees. The Pharisees were people who were theologically orthodox. They had all the right answers to the important doctrinal questions. They were pious. But they were judges of people, and they were opposite of the character that Jesus wanted, as Jesus himself says in verse 36, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. In verses 37 through 45, the verses we've read today are an exposition of what it means to be merciful, and that is different from the Pharisees who sat in judgment upon people. How many people have here, perhaps if I ask for a show of hands, how many people here, and I don't raise your hand, but have been hurt by someone that maybe uh, thought of themselves as spiritual, but perhaps they looked down upon you and have criticized you and, and hurt you because of their criticism. That, uh, that was the case with the Pharisees. It's so easy to be a Pharisee if you're walking with God and if you have all the right answers to the doctrinal questions, you can begin to assume that somehow you're better than other people and God thinks better of you than he does of others. That was certainly the difficulty with the Pharisees. It's difficult with a lot of people who live with a legalistic faith, a legalistic religion. One of my favorite stories is from my pastor friend Marvin Gorman who pastors First Assembly of God in New Orleans, Louisiana, a church that in the last 15 to 20 years has grown from about less than 100 people to maybe five, 10,000 people are now in the congregation. And in the early days of that church, Pastor Marvin Gorman was talking about the event that sort of changed his whole view of people and changed his whole ministry. He had been up to that time what we used to call a clothesline preacher. Clothesline preachers were legalists and their idea was to help uh, women be as ugly as they possibly could by telling them what all was wrong for them to wear and to put on. And Marvin was great at that. And in the early days of a great work of the Holy Spirit in that church, and the church was packed with people, he noticed that one evening an usher ushered down a lady in her early 20s to the front row, and she was in short shorts. And Marvin was just about to come unglued on the platform trying to give ushers the body language to get that lady out of here, and they didn't ever see him, and he wasn't going to go down and you know, make an embarrassment of her and him, so he let her remain. And he was thinking to himself, the gall, the very audacity of that lady being in this church dressed like that. And when he gave the altar call at the end of the service, this lady responded and gave her life to Christ and wept and wept. 
Marvin Gorman went over and began to talk to her and found out that she was a young divorcee. She had two small children. And here's how she got to the church, because he asked her. She said she was at a bus stop that evening, had gotten off work from her shift as a cocktail waitress, was getting ready to go home, and one of the old ladies from First Assembly and New Orleans was there waiting for the bus to go to church. She began to strike up a conversation with this young woman and said, well, honey, you need to come to church, and God can help you with your life. And she said, oh, I couldn't go to church. So they, I couldn't, I'm not dressed for church because she wanted to go with her right then. She said, oh, honey, she says, at our church, we accept people just the way they are. <laughs> huh. God did something through that in Marvin's heart about being judgmental toward people. In this portion of Scripture, Jesus is talking with us about living without censoring people, living without an attitude of judgmentalism. As I was working on a sermon title for this message, I thought of some cute ones like, Super Critics Make Bad Livers. And then I thought, well, a better theological one would be the Grace Givers, because he wants us to be that. But I finally settled on generosity, the glue of human relationships because it is the generous life, the life filled with grace that Christ is seeking to develop, not only here in this passage, but throughout all of his ministry. Be merciful as the Father in heaven is merciful. There are some things that this passage of Scripture is telling us are going to happen to our lives if generosity is not present. There are three of them in particular I want to look at with you. The first thing that's going to happen in our life if generosity and grace is not present is that we are going to sit in judgment upon other people. There are two meanings for the word judge. One meaning is to simply uh, come to a right decision, and the other meaning is to condemn a person. It's this second kind of meaning that the Lord is talking about. And when he says, do not judge, we must recognize that he's speaking out of a teaching of balance. In the parallel passage in the Sermon on the Mount, after teaching about not judging, he then turns around and tells us not to throw what is holy to the dogs or cast pearls before pigs. And obviously that involves some kind of discernment or judging. The Lord is not throwing out all discernment with this phrase, do not judge. What he's saying is do not sit in a position of your life on condemnation and judgment on upon another person. He does call us to make moral choices between good and evil, between the better and the best. He calls us to exercise discipline within the body of Christ. But there is a distinction between being a witness and being a judge. And while we are called to be as witnesses, we can witness and see wrong and right and take our stand as a witness. But we are in no position to sit in judgment on a person and render the final decision and condemn them forever to the prison of our judgment. The problem with judging is that once we arrive at an understanding of where we think a person is, we've confined them to that. We've locked them in that box of our condemnation and they can't get out of the judgment we give them. So often the judgment that we place upon people is not limited to the people that we meet on the periphery of our lives, but the judgment comes to people that are close to us within family, husbands and wives and children and parents. We must be as careful not to construct idols of other humans as, as perhaps we are careful not to construct idols of God. So often we are looking for the ideal person in family, the ideal wife the ideal husband, the ideal child, the ideal parent. Hey, the ideal doesn't exist except in Christ. If you've been around the church for a while, you probably think I'm an ideal person, right? I'm just perfect and trucking along, no rough spots to my personality. You should talk with my wife. And if you want to know about her, you should talk with me. <clears throat> After 20 years of marriage, we're growing together. We're not perfect people. One of the things that has to happen to make a relationship work is that we need to take the idolatry off the relationship, the things we are trying to say, I'm not going to love you unless you're this kind of person. So often we sit in judgment and we say, you don't match what I'm looking for. You don't have the right job. You don't have the right personality. You're not as caring as someone else. And all those may be true, but at the same time, when we take a standpoint of judgment toward another person, we then begin to look 
for that other person to change instead of making changes ourselves. The judging person is forever waiting for someone else to change. The loving person is seeking change within themselves. And that's the difference between the two. As long as we place blame for our problems on another person's shoulders, as long as we sit in judgment for them, for our being the way we are, we will never change, we'll never be different. A condemning person is critical and argumentative and picky. Jesus is calling us out of that bondage by telling us to quit blaming and condemning, to forgive people, to set them free, to release them from the prison of our judgment, and to give. Giving is something that involves far more than money, although it's, there's an instant connection between a generous person financially and a generous person in their spirituality and in their relationships. I've yet to find a financial tightwad who was a generous and loving person within their family. Financial tightwads tend to be people that are difficult to live with because they're playing life very close to the vest and very, what, can you do, what have you done for me lately? But Jesus is telling us to release and to give. Not just to give of our finances, but to give time. Maybe your giving may mean the giving of time. It may mean giving a flower or a, a bouquet of flowers. It may mean giving up some things that uh, are important for you. It may mean giving kind and healing words. It may mean the most important thing, giving of yourself. The Lord teaches us that without generosity in our life, without grace, without magnanimity, we are going to sit in judgment upon people rather than loving them and loving God and loving ourselves. A second result of the lack of generosity in our life is that without generosity, we bring loss into our life. Jesus conveys this through four different illustrations or metaphors. He talks about the good measure that is given to us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And here he's dealing with agricultural times, or agricultural terms of that time, because people in those days wore a loose robe that around the waist was tied with a belt or a girdle of sash of some kind. And the, and the waist had this ability to, to flower out sort of and have a deep pocket in it. And if you were going to the marketplace to buy your grain you, and you wanted to get a good buy, somebody would pack the grain in there in your lap and then press it down and shake it together so that it sifted and, and have it running over. That was getting a good buy. Anyone that's ever done shopping in a marketplace environment knows the importance of, of watching that you don't get taken. I know when we were, when I was a kid in China, my parents used to have to be very careful about the quality of the milk we bought, because if we weren't careful, we'd get half water, half milk, and be paying for milk. So the Lord is saying, if you're a giving person, then you get this back in your life. Obviously, the loss is, if you're not a giving person, then that doesn't happen to you. You are not given back in life. And he says the loss also relates to the fact that we become blind and blind leaders following the blind and we become the student who places ourselves above and beyond the teacher. Now everybody knows today that students are smarter than teachers. But in biblical days that wasn't so because then they didn't have computers, then they didn't have libraries, and then they didn't have multiple teachers. In those days if you were a student you had one teacher and you were not smarter than the teacher because he had knowledge, that's why he had a teacher. Or that's why you had him as a teacher. And the Lord, in using this particular phrase, is saying to us as his disciples, look, you must be generous as I am generous. I am your teacher. You must follow me. A student doesn't know more than his teacher. And, and I get, I must confess, really concerned in the deep core of, our, of my being when I talk with people who say to me, I want to be a Christian. I want to be saved. But I just don't agree with Jesus on that point. We cannot be a Christian and disagree with Jesus on anything. Student is not above his teacher. And the Lord also tells us that uh, we must be the person who recognizes that if we are sitting in judgment and censoring another person, we bring loss to our own life by, by not being discerning of our own faults. We have a beam in our eye trying to p take a fleck of dust from someone else's. Dr. David Fink, who is a psychiatrist, and uh, works with the Veterans Administration, some time ago wrote an article for Coronet Magazine. 
in which he reported the results of a study that he had done. As a psychiatrist working with the Veterans Administration, he'd come across literally thousands of case studies of people that were suffering severe emotional and mental disturbances. And he decided to uh, develop a testing instrument which would be tested on, a number, on several thousand mentally and emotionally disturbed people and then tested on a healthy sample, sample group within the population also of several thousand people. When the test results were completed, Dr. Fink reported that he came to a conclusion that there was one outstanding fact that stood out above all other facts in comparing the unhealthy group to the healthy group. And the fact was this, those who had extreme tension in their life had one trait in common. They were habitual fault finders, constant critics of people around them and things around them. It's exactly what the Lord said. We we get what we give, and if we are giving criticism and judgment and sitting, censoring other people, then that comes back in our life, and we're dissatisfied with life ourselves. We make the choice, Jesus is saying, as to whether the outcome of life will be the grain in our lap or the log in our eye. Without generosity, we sit in judgment upon others, we bring loss into our own life, and we bring destruction to others. That's the idea of verses 43 through 45, the good fruit and the good tree. The good tree is bringing something forth tasty and delicious, delectable to other people. But the bad tree, the bad life, the life with criticism and judgment is producing ugh in other people's lives. A pastor friend of mine several years ago said, you know, George, in my early years of ministry, I spent an awful lot of my time trying to make unhappy people happy. And I came to the conclusion that you cannot make unhappy people happy. You can only make them less unhappy for a time. But they will go back to being their true selves after a while. On the other hand, he said, I found that basically happy people, you cannot make them unhappy. You can make them less happy for a while, but they will also revert to their natural state. And he, he said there, I therefore learned to save a lot of time in ministry of not trying to make unhappy people happy. And that's exactly what the Lord is saying here. The bad tree brings forth bad fruit. So there's not an inner core of wellness, and therefore it cannot produce the sort of wellness on a long-term basis that benefits other people. It brings loss into life. Of course, with generosity, the opposite things take place. With generosity, we give unconditional love and acceptance to other people. We learn a kind of love that does not depend upon somebody else's response to us, but is inward motivated and God directed. We bring gain into our life because by being a person of grace or by being a generous person, we are then receiving grace back. And we bring encouragement and strength and life to other people by being generous and by being filled with grace rather than bringing destruction into their lives really wrestled with using this story that I ran across this week. I loved it so well that I'm going to risk using it even at the price of it not fitting the message. But I think it'll fit. I read a story of a lady that was vacuuming the cage of her pet bird, vacuuming the bottom of the cage. Pretty Pete was the bird's name. And the phone rang. And the lady went to answer the phone, but she wasn't careful what she did to the end of the vacuum hose. She left it dangling in the cage. And uh, long, well, you can see this one coming. <laughs> Suddenly she heard this loud squawk. And she realized that the vacuum cleaner had sucked up pretty peat. So she put the phone down real quick. She ran over to the vacuum cleaner bag and opened it up and there was pretty Pete lying in the bag of dirt all dirty and wounded and bleeding and uh, she picked him out of there and took him over to the kitchen sink and washed him off and he was alive put him back in his cage and let him sit there <laughs> a few days later a friend was asking her how pretty Pete was doing and she said oh he's doing all right I guess but he just sits and stares off into space with a kind of glassy stare in his eyes. And I thought, you know, there are people I know that have come into, have had an experience in life that is sort of like that. They were sitting on their perts singing and everything seemed to be going all right and then life dealt them a cruel twist and they got sucked up 
in the vacuum cleaner of life. And now, instead of being joyful and happy anymore, they're sitting in their perch of life, glassy-eyed and staring. And if I were to ask for a show of hands as to how many have had an experience like that and you've, in your insides, are glassy-eyed and staring, I bet I'd get a lot of hands raised. What do you say to people who have had a brutalizing experience in life who, because they have opened the door even of sin into their life, aren't singing anymore, are miserable, absolutely miserable on the inside. Will you ever sing again? The good news of Jesus Christ is that if you will make him Lord of your life, he'll replace in your life the song, the song of his presence. And the glassy-eyed stare will not just stay there in your life, because he has this power to heal us from the inside so that the tree of our life will bear good fruit. And on the other hand, if we choose not to make Jesus the Lord of our life, the joy and the song of life will not be there again. I am so keenly conscious as pastor, as a person who spends a great deal of my time ministering to Christians, that there is such a thing as starting the Christian walk by making Jesus Lord. And then somewhere in the journey of the Christian life, failing to keep him as Lord, and the song goes out when we begin to go our own way. And the only way to get the song back and to make good fruit in our life is to put him again as the Lord of our life to make the same kind of crystal clear decision now as we did when we first began to follow him. Be a person of grace. Persons of grace have received God's grace, and that is the glue that bonds us to God is his grace. And the glue of human relationships is that grace and generosity we pour out upon others. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in this moment in your presence. We recognize, Lord, that there are probably people here today who have known what it is for someone to sit in judgment upon them, to be harsh with them and cruel and unkind. And we all know the kind of fruit that's produced in our life when that happens. We also know, Lord, the only kind of way to overcome that is to forgive and to determine to pattern after you. And rather than receiving what has been thrown at us that is hurtful and harmful, we simply release it and drop it at your feet and measure our lives by what you think of us in your great grace. We think, too, Lord, of persons in the church family today that maybe feel like they have really gotten vacuumed up in the lint bag of life. And there's just a lot of hurt that's been present, so indescribable that words are insufficient for it, a tearing of the heart, a rending of the inside. And you are the great searcher of the heart, and you alone are the great healer of the heart. And I pray, Lord, that in the life of anyone who feels that loss today, that glassy-eyed stare, that you'll come gently to their life and that they will open wide the door of their heart to acknowledge you as Lord. For it is when we make you Lord that we own up to your great love for us, that we open the door to healing, that we take the hurt that has been thrown at us and we say, God will make it for good. And when we also take the sin in our life, which many times causes us the wounds, and we say, oh Lord, free me, forgive me of my sin. Though my sins are as scarlet, though they are red as crimson, though they are indelibly dyed into my life, you, O oh Lord, can wash me and make me white again and make me pure. We thank you, Lord, that you're doing that.